So we can start tonight by recollecting a great disciple of the Buddhas named Anattapindaka, which means one who puts food into beggar's bowls, one who gives out food. And Anattapindaka was a rich merchant who heard the Buddha's teaching and whose mind and heart were so prepared for this moment that when he heard the Dhamma, pity or rapture arose in him. However, this pity was not normal pity, not normal rapture, but rather an exceptional kind based in the paramitas or spiritual qualities he had built over a long time. And it was a, enough that upon hearing the Dhamma, he was able to see the Dhamma, see the truth of the teaching due to this param- paramitta, these spiritual perfections. The Buddha taught Anattapindaka and all of his disciples the importance of cultivating various wholesome qualities in the heart. He taught us to develop giving, to develop faith. This quality of faith, which was so prominent in Anattapindaka, led him to follow diligently the Buddha's instructions in all parts of his life. The Buddha said to give, and so he gave. He did not hoard wealth, and neither should we. We should practice as Anattapindaka did, and put forth effort in the formal meditation. This bhavana, or development of the mind through formal practice, is the peak of the practice, is the peak of the path. One who practices sees the dangers in samsara, the cycle of existence. Even as a lay person, one can cultivate this perception or recollection of the dangers inherent in continued rebirth and existence. We may have great wealth in our lives. We may have accumulated many possessions, but we see the precariousness of such possessions, the danger in an existence which inevitably ends in our passing away from all that we've gathered, all these possessions we've accumulated, and so we don't attach. Rather, seeing the danger and the instability in samsara and in our lives, We focus on doing good. We take what wealth we can and we give to others. We develop good acts of merit with that wealth. And we don't hoard or attach to it since we realize we cannot take it with us when we pass. In the suttas, there's a story of a famous disciple of the Buddha named Ratapala. And Ratapala, after having ordained and attained, attaining arahantship, full enlightenment, returned home to visit his mother and father as he had promised to. Upon seeing him, his mother and father invited him in, laid out his inheritance, a great pile of wealth, and invited his former wives to come and attempt to tempt him to seduce him back into the lay life and into marriage. However, Ratapala's heart was pure and established in Dhamma. He was not interested in these baits of the world and was able to remain solid in his state as a monk. He was an arahant and so was safe from such things. Similarly, we can recollect 
the transitory nature of all of our external wealth and attachments, possessions, etc. And understand more and more how inner wealth is what is truly essential and important in our lives. Such wealth, such inner wealth, is composed of these qualities of sata, faith, and effort in the practice, namely effort to abandon the defilements of the heart, or the kilesa. We understand and contemplate that what is outside of us lacks true essence and will pass. We rather apply ourselves to chanting, to meditating, to applying our mindfulness to the four Satipatthana outlined in the Satipatthana Sutta, the establishments of mindfulness, namely the body, feelings, mind, and dhammas, or mental qualities. By recollecting the Satipatthana, these four foundations frequently, and using them in our practice, we protect our heart. We, by bringing the mind constantly back to these foundations and seeing just the body and the body, feelings and feelings, mind and mind and mental qualities and mental qualities, restrain the heart from going out and chasing after the various impressions which impact it every day. And this restraint of the heart gives rise to true qualities of true value. It's a practice that's truly precious to us, this protection of the mind. In many ways, it can be compared to the outfit of clothes that we wear every day. And if our clothes are dirty, we aren't comfortable unless we've washed them. We understand immediately that when stained, we need to wash our clothes. And similarly with the mind, when it's stained and dirtied with various defilement, then we wash it. And such washing is the practice of meditation and the practice of the Eightfold Path. This is how we purify the heart. Once the mind gains strength and purity, then it can simply know the various aramana or impressions which impact it, which it encounters, and it does not attach to them. The Buddha taught that all conditioned phenomena are anicca, anatta, and dukkha, changeable, not self, and stressful or suffering. And when we don't see this, then we attach to everything or to our various impressions as a self, as mine. The body is taken by the mind as self, as a possession, And it believes, the mind believes that the body is sukha or pleasurable. However, the body follows its natural course and decays, it changes, and it rests beyond our control. It sickens and eventually dies. And as the heart experiences this separation from what it is claimed as its own, then it suffers. This is the essence of Sakaya Ditti, self-view. Sakaya Ditti, this form of wrong view, is the way the mind attaches and identifies with the various khandas or aggregates, and specifically in this example, the body. It leads to suffering, and so we must work to change our view and see the body not as ourselves. 
This applies to the mind or chitta as well. We look at the mind and understand that it is not worthy of being called our self or ours. We can ask ourselves if we are able to control the mind, the chitta. Can we make it happy? Can we force it to experience only pleasant sensations? Can we control its state? When we ask ourselves these questions, we see clearly that we do not have full control over the mind and so cannot reliably or accurately identify with it as a self or as ours. It encounters various experiences with which it grows bored or grows intoxicated or which it develops strong dislike for. All of these feelings arise in the mind based on its experiences every day. And we do not have full control over those experiences. Rather, when we establish this foundation of mindfulness, we see how the, namely the foundation of mind, of mindfulness of the mind, Chitanusati. Then we see how these various impressions arise, remain, and pass. Liking arises, remains for time, and passes. Disliking arises, remains, passes. When the chitta is affected with greed or lopa, this greed arises, remains, and passes. Aversion comes into being, stays for a while, and goes away. Delusion is the same. The chitta constantly experiences these changing sensations and feelings. And we can ask ourselves why the mind is without these kilesas at times and why it is with them at times. And we will answer that it is because of the knowing or lack of knowing of those various kilesas or mental impressions. If we see clearly and with strong mindfulness the arising of greed, delusion, aversion, then the kilesa of greed, aversion, or delusion are allowed to simply come into being, stay, and pass away according to their natural course, and the mind is largely unaffected by them. It simply knows them. Sometimes we might experience the fruits of practice, wholesome states or refined states of meditation and might think that our practice is the best. It's better than those around us. We've advanced a great deal. We might think that even someone who'd practiced for many lifetimes couldn't match us. However, this is just one more mental impression and we should not attach to it. Similarly, if we compare ourselves to others as worse or even the same, all of this is mana or self view and therefore all wrong view. Rather, we should just look on what comes into being as Dhamma and observe it with mindfulness. To develop the strength of mind needed for this, we establish sati, mindfulness, constantly within the four foundations of mindfulness. We develop a kamatana or meditation object, such as the meditation word budo. Constantly, while we walk, sit, stand, lie down, remain silent, speak, and go through the various actions of our day, we work to establish and strengthen our sati or mindfulness. 
such cont continuity of mindfulness leads eventually to samadhi, lucid calm, and this to panya, or wisdom. What's all important in all of these cases is the fact that we are putting forth effort in our practice to develop the mind and heart, and this leads to results. We can practice in other ways as well. We can recollect the good we've done, what, what we've given, what effort we've put into practice. We can recollect the pilgrimages we may have made to holy sites in India, where the Buddha taught, became enlightened, passed away into Parinibbana, where he was born. We can think of the suttas and of the great disciples of the Buddha. Whatever recollection associated with the Buddha, we can bring up in order to feel our heart fill with faith. This is worthy. And this is the meditation object of Buddhanusati, recollection of the Buddha. It's the Buddhanusati Kamatana. We should recollect this frequently because if we do not, then the mind will inevitably go elsewhere and will busy itself with less wholesome objects. We have to work in our daily lives and sometimes apply the mind to such work. But once we're done, we put it down and pull the heart and mind back to thinking about such wholesome and good things. On a previous day, a Western monk's parents came to the monastery. They asked about the Buddhist path of practice. They were interested in such practice and wanted to know more about it. I answered that the path of practice in Buddhism is or deals with the mind and the heart and the development of internal qualities and is not concerned with or bound up with the externals of life. The externals in life, conditioned phenomena exter uh, outside of oneself are short-lived, they fade, and upon death we leave them. However, the practice of bhavana mental development of sila or morality bring true peace. These internal qualities bring a lasting serenity. And they usher into realization. And such realization is the Buddha coming forth within us. Longpur Cha, Ajahn Cha, frequently asked if the Buddha could be born in Thailand. This rhetorical question was made to point to the fact that we can realize the Dhamma even here. And when we see the Dhamma, then we see that the truth that comes forth in us upon such realization is the Buddha and is the Sangha as well, that all three gems are effectively the same. Before liberation, we separated these three aspects of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha from one another. But after realization, they are as one. So we must practice, chant, Meditate, put forth effort. This human life is of inestimable value and we must use it well. Some people have only a short period of time to put forth effort in their practice. Seven days, 15, a month. But what they're doing in all of these cases, if they're sincere, is looking for the Buddha. They're looking for realization. 
the disciples of the past engaged in the same search, whether it be Lady Visaka, a great disciple of the Buddha known for her kindness and also her attainment of some of the fruits of enlightenment, or others in the Buddha's time and since, all developed along these lines of sila, dana, bhavana, ethics, giving, and practice. And through this path, they all abandoned their doubt, any doubt that they might have had in the efficacy, the power of this path of the triple gem. Eventually, through their efforts, the path gathered in their hearts and led them to see the Buddha and to become liberated. So I encourage you all this evening to put forth effort towards that same liberation.